this is uh, the third of the DC controls classes, and the uh, title of this class is uh, Breaker Controls 2. And uh, before we dive in, I want to give you a safety tip, and that is when you visit a substation, to the extent possible, don't touch anything. There's really nothing to be gained by touching stuff. If you're out in the yard and you happen to lean against, you know, a structure or something, well, you know, stray voltages in, in a, in a, happen in, in substations. That's why we have, you know, put so much effort into the grounding systems and all. And so there's really no, nothing, no benefit there. And when you go into the control building, you don't want to touch stuff because there's a lot of live wires that may not be covered very well. And heaven forbid if you touch something and actually cause the breaker to trip. That would really have a, a, a negative impact on, your, on you and us. and uh, uh, It's just one of those things no one, no one would win from. So anyway, to the extent possible, uh, touch nothing in a substation. In fact, when I'm in a substation, I, I generally don't like to uh, put my hands in my pockets. I kind of think it looks unprofessional. But in a substation, I'll just walk around with my hands in my pockets. And just as a reminder of myself, don't touch anything. All right, moving along. Um, in this class, we're going to continue the study of uh, circuit breakers and how to control them. And uh, we're going to review what we covered in last week's class. And we're going to kind of take it a step further. The drawings that we're looking at, by the time we're done today, we should have pretty much every little nook and cranny of that drawing covered. Um, we're also going to um, add in a couple features that you would find not in the, the uh, control cabinet of the breaker, but back in the uh, control building and specifically a lockout relay and a sync check relay, which are ANSI numbers uh, 86 and 25. And then uh, we're also going to pay some uh, closer attention to the charging circuits and to the, uh, the heating circuits. Uh, anyway, let's dive right in. And uh, I'd like everyone to look at the, your drawing and find the closed coil on it. And uh, the closed coil would be located, if you're looking at your drawing, right around in here, okay? And then uh, above that is what I would refer to as the supervisory leg. And I call it that because it's going to supervise closing and it's going to prevent you from closing for any of the, the things, you know, conditions that we want to avoid closing for. And we, we talked about a number of these uh, last week uh, and Low gas would be one of them if you uh, don't have uh, proper insulation within the uh, breaker. Uh, you certainly don't want to um, be able to close the breaker. Uh, if your motor is not charged, you certainly do not want to close. And uh, then you'll also find in there a 52B contact. So before you can close the breaker, the breaker's got to be open. And uh, if the breaker's already closed, you don't want to be running uh, voltage to the closed coil. It's not going to do anything, and you run risk of damaging the clo closed coil or burning it up and making it so it doesn't, isn't going to work uh, for you. Okay, and then we talked last week about the anti-pumping scheme, and it's part of the, this uh, uh, circuit, and it's located right over here. And Again, to reiterate what the anti-pumping scheme will do, when you close the breaker, it's going to, uh, and the breaker is closed, but you still have DC applied to that circuit, it's going to prevent that from going to the closed coil, but it's also going to prevent the thing from, from operating. It's going to stay locked in until you remove DC from that circuit. And what it'll do is it'll prevent you, if you have a standing close, and a standing trip from uh, closed trip, closed trip, closed trip on the circuit breaker. Um, besides wreaking havoc on the electrical system that you're connected to, it's also going to damage the breaker. So uh, we want to prevent that. Now then, let's look a little closer at these. Oh, and also uh, uh, the motor charging circuit uh, is, is right here. Now then, let's dissect these a little bit further and see where these come from within the drawing. Okay. Let's get it about right there. Now then, 
as we go to the right from the closed circuit, the first thing that we run into is uh, the trip circuit. And I'm going to put that off for a few minutes uh, and talk about it in conjunction with uh, the next topic. But the next uh, uh, ladder over to the right is the uh, low gas alarm. And remember that these are shown in the de-energized state, which in a circuit breaker means there's no control voltage, it's been turned off, and there's no, uh, there's no gas in the, in the breaker, so it's not charged with gas. And so what you're seeing when you look at this, uh, that figure right there, that's the actual um, pressure valve it, 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 it in the breaker. And when you fill it up with gas, that's going to open that switch. Okay, so if it's in the de-energized state, no gas, then it's closed. When you gas the breaker, it opens. Now then, right below that, you have the 63 uh, G1X. What, what's the 63 relay again? It's a pressure relay. But at the X at, it, at the end of it means that it's just actually an auxiliary relay in the pressure, uh, part of the pressure system. Now, right above that, notice that there is a normally closed contact from that relay in parallel with a resistor. Anyone know why you would do that? It's kind of, it seems like kind of an odd thing to do. And it, it's an interesting little trick that uh, we use to make that uh, relay operate faster. So when, when the, the, uh, that 63 uh, G1X contact is closed, it has shunted out that, uh, that resistor. So in effect, the resistor is not in the circuit. And so you'll have a, a higher current flow through that uh, coil. It'll operate faster, but as soon as it operates, that, six, that, that B contact opens, and now the resistor is in the circuit. Well, the resistor is sized enough that it, that, that contact will stay picked up, and you, but you won't be consuming as much uh, uh, current going through it. Does that make sense? Yeah, it, it's an interesting little trick that, uh, you know, in the, in the uh, control world to just make, get things to operate a little faster. Now, if you are executing this scheme not with a discrete device like we are, but with a programmed relay, would you need that, would you need that feature in it? Well, no, because, you know, in, you're, you're really not consuming anything in, uh, when it's a, a programmed logic. Now, if you, so we've covered the low gas uh, ladder in the logic, and the next couple have to do with motor charging. And let's first look, <coughs> look right down here at the motor charging circuit. And uh, beyond these two test switches, uh, you have, it kind of looks really redundant. You have a couple 88M contacts and a 49M. 88M is the, uh, is the motor contactor that's controlling the motor. And 49M, if you look at your ANSI numbering uh, list, is a thermal relay. And what it's there for is in case the motor uh, is getting too hot, you're, you're, op you're over operating it. And, uh, and, but notice that it, when the 40, excuse, yeah, excuse me, the 49 uh, runs uh, and picks up, you end up actually tripping this device. And I if you look through and go through the logic embedded in this leg, there's a, also a 48 relay, and 48 has to do with a sequence of operations that essentially something has gone wrong with the motor. The motor is not working, and you are going to lock out the motor. And that means that this breaker no longer operates. So if that happens, pretty big deal. And you'll notice down here in alarm contacts, there is one of those. So if, you, if that happens to your circuit breaker, it's really important that operators know that so they can go fix the thing, because it's not going to operate. It's dead at that point. 
Okay, any questions about that? And about this, this circuit here and how it relates to this? You can see that the, uh, the, uh, the uh, 88M relay is controlled in this leg. And notice it's supervised by one of its own contacts. But then there's an interesting device called a 33. And if, if you uh, read the ANSI description for 33, it does not have uh, the term limit switch in it. And this is what that is. This is a little limit switch. And it's how they accomplish this, I can't tell because it's buried inside of this device. But as you push this, you can feel that you go through a certain barrier and there's contacts inside here that change state. And I'll pass this around so everyone can feel it. This is the limit switch that's inside of a circuit breaker in the spring charging mechanism. So remember I described the spring charging mechanism as a bunch of Belleville washers that are uh, on, um, back and go back and forth so that you compress it to charge the spring. At a certain point as you're compressing it, that happens and it turns it off. And then when you discharge it too much, there'll be another one that'll do that and it'll start back up. So anyway, that's how the motor is controlled. Um, you know, you have to turn it on and off when it's, um, when it's needed for charging. And otherwise, you want to protect it so, you know, if the thing uh, is damaged and isn't uh, going to operate, it's taken out of the circuit, it's locked out, and an alarm is sent. That's the basic functions or functionality uh, of that, uh, that part of the control scheme. Okay, any questions on that? There are a couple other features on this that are actually unique to this client. And, and this, this is a breaker that's um, owned by Southern California Edison. And if you look at these devices, like right here and right over here, and then a couple of others scattered around here, they don't seem to have any purpose for the operation of the circuit breaker. And the reason that those are there is for testing. Um, the, in routine maintenance on testing, or on circuit breakers, requires testing um, generally once every five years uh, or depending on how much use the circuit breaker is seeing. And what you do when you, among other things, when you test a breaker is you time it. You, you put in a, a, a sensor so it's recording when um, current is flowing through the various trip and close coils and then you actually time the, the motion of the circuit breaker with it. Well, if you don't have these test plugs in that circuit, you actually have to unscrew wires, lift them up, and, and then put, you know, run those into your test equipment. Now, if you think about when you do that. Think about the problems that that can cause because you've got a perfectly good breaker sitting there. Now you have to change wiring in it, test it. Now you have to hope that you put the wiring back in the correct places. Otherwise, you've got a tested breaker that you want to put back in service, and maybe it's not going to go back in service properly. So anyway, that's, this is how Edison gets around this problem. And uh, uh, to me, it seems like a really good idea. Um, but every utility has their own way of doing this, and they own a, you know, their own system for it, and they've equipped their test personnel with that equipment. So you have to understand how the breaker is going to be tested if you want to properly specify and design it. Um, the last thing that I want to cover on this, uh, on this drawing actually is down at the bottom. And here are the heaters. And notice that these go to AC, not to DC. It's kind of an interesting thing on this breaker because notice right above it that the motor is charged with DC. Now it's an option in circuit breakers to have your motor run off of AC rather than DC. It's also an option, albeit a more expensive one, to have uh, to run motor off of both. So that it runs off of AC unless the AC source is dead and then it goes to DC. Um, and th again, this is an option. I, I'm, I'm not going to cover that in this class, but just an option th that I want you to be aware of that you're, uh, that's available in circuit breakers. Now notice this circuit over here. 
These heaters are on all the time. They're protected by a molded case circuit breaker, uh, and they're run, in this case, at uh, 240 volt AC. Notice that these heaters over here are controlled by a thermostat. And so uh, these are on all the time. On a nice, deep, cold night, that's the one that will come on and continue to keep uh, the, the cabinet uh, warm and dry. OK, there's a, a scheme that it, you'll see occasionally, um, although not as much anymore as, as we used to when we used oil circuit breakers. And it's called the 52X scheme. <coughs> And the way this works, the instead of when you close uh, um, your close contact, instead of having that energize the close coil, <clears throat> it just energizes an auxiliary relay, and then that auxiliary relay um, cl uh, will close, and that will energize the close coil. Now, anyone want to hazard a guess? as to why you would do something like this. And the answer is that in the old days, closed coils were much larger than they are now, and they might be drawing 10, 15 amps. <clears throat> if you look on this drawing, I think this one says that the, that the closed coil draws less than four amps. Okay, in a large substation, your battery could be 2,000 feet away from the circuit breaker. And so you've got some voltage drop issues to consider there. One solution around that is to use a 52X relay and then run using larger cable out to a DC distribution box in the switch rack that would actually provide the, the, the DC to actually operate the breaker. You don't see that this, you know, you don't see this that often anymore, but I just wanted to bring it up so that if you do run into it, you do see a breaker that has a 52X in it, you'll understand what it is. It will affect the anti-pumping scheme because now you're going to have the anti-pumping scheme protecting the 52X coil rather than the trip coil. But other than that, it actually um, it is pretty much the same. But again, when you, whenever you get a new, dr uh, a new breaker and you're reviewing it, you want to go through this and make sure that you understand how these schemes operate, because every breaker manufacturer will do it a little bit differently. All right, I'd like now to add a, one part to our closed logic. Everything we've talked about up till now today is, exists within the circuit breaker control cabinet. Okay, there's a couple reasons that we might want to not close the circuit breaker, and these, um, though, will reside back in the control house. And the two um, that I have in mind that I want to discuss today is, what if you've got a lockout relay tripped and you're trying, you know, and it, it's, so it's connected to one of the protective schemes and it's tripped, the lockout relay is in, in the lockout position. Well, at that point, and I've drawn, drawn this up here on the screen, or on the, the, the whiteboard, at that point, you want to open up that contact so that you can't close the breaker. If it's in lockout, you do not want to close it. Okay, so most utilities, not all, but most, will have you wire an 86B contact into the closed circuit in series with the contacts that you're using to close it, be this a, a control switch or a SCADA contact. That's pretty straightforward. And now on the trip side of the equation, and this is the trip coil over here, that same relay is going to be wired to trip the breaker. This is pretty intuitive. I mean, by this time, I think most people have gotten the idea of tripping circuit breakers and what you want to do. You just got to keep in mind that once you've tripped it, you want to prevent it from closing again uh, until a human being has reset the lockout relay. Okay, there's another reason that we might not want to uh, close the circuit breaker. Um, when you have a circuit breaker that's open, You've got voltage live, and assume that you've got voltage live on both sides. Uh, what if you were not in phase? So say A phase on this side is not lined up with A phase on this side. That would be a good reason to not close the breaker. Um, you know, and how would this happen, okay? Well, the main way would be 
that it was during a construct, you know, you were doing some construction in your substation and you got the phasing wrongs. It's, it's really shocking how often that happens. I can think of four or five times in the last 10 years that this happened. And Lordy, if they had closed those circuit breakers, it would be like closing into a, you know, well, it would be like closing A phase into B phase. You know, it's gonna be a tremendous fault on the system. Uh, it's certainly not, <laughs> not gonna do any of our careers any good to have that happen. So anyway, kidding aside, that's how we, we deal with this. And we use a thing called a sync check relay for it. And the basic idea in a sync check relay, again, it, it, it's within the supervisory leg. Um, so think not or logic. Okay, it's in the control room. And uh, eh, I've kind of gone up there. And so you're looking at the phase angles um, from either side of the circuit breaker. Now then, the sketch that I've, the two sketches I've shown here, picture that this is the circuit breaker that we're wanting to control. And you have to have a voltage source from either side of the, of the uh, breaker. Now you can be kind of creative where you get these from, but you have to have it. There's, there's not an option for this. Now say this point that we're connecting to was a transformer. Depending on the configuration of the transformer, you could actually take this voltage from the low side of the transformer if it were available there and you did so you didn't have to put a PT in on this side. Okay, there's a, there's a number of ways you can get around this, uh, you know, that problem. But again, you simply have to have it. Now, assuming that both sides are hot, and I'll cover the, the situation here in a minute where they're not. Assuming both sides are hot, if you had a sync scope on the, the you know, on this position or in this, this substation, what you would see, the bus position is always at vertical. Then there's gonna be another needle that's gonna go around and swing around uh, it, it, with the phase angle on the line side. Okay, and if generally a normal setting for this is plus or minus 30 degrees. So if you're, if you're looking at your sync scope and you're, you're over here, yeah, it's okay to close. Now ideally it's gonna be straight up and they're gonna be perfectly in sync. And you know, we don't live in a perfect world so sometimes it's that way, sometimes it's not. Now let me go off on a, a couple little tangents here. What if instead of a transform, or uh, what if on the other side of this transformer, we have a generator? Okay. Well, what happens if on this side we're at system voltage, so it's at 60 hertz, and it's perfectly at 60 hertz? What if on this side they're just going a little slower than 60 hertz? Well, what you're going to see is this thing gonna, is going to spin. Now, if they go above 60 hertz, it's going to spin, but it's going to go the opposite direction. And that's called sl um, um, slip angle. Okay, um, a few years ago, I did a series of projects on the island of Kauai, and their electrical system is relatively small, as you would imagine. It's not a large island, and they have just a, a handful of substations. They also have um, fairly frequent uh, outages on the island, and when they have to put their system back together again, there's a lot of times that they need to sit there with a sync scope and connect two parts that are, are both energized, but they're islanded from each other. And so what they'll be looking at, they can often get their machines to operate at 60 hertz, but they'll be you know, out at a phase angle where you can't close in. If you closed in, you're gonna lose both systems. Everything's gonna shut off and you get to start the whole process over again. And so what they do is the guy will be, they'll, they'll be talking to the operators and one side will have to accelerate and move their phase angle up towards zero and then, then slow it back down so it's at 60 hertz and you close in at, at that time. It's a, a, a handy device. Not all, that, not all that many substations get sync scopes in them, but if you're connecting generation, you really need this feature. Usually, instead of a sync scope, we just have a sync check relay, and that's really what I'm describing here. So typically, 
what you're going to have is a sync scope or, or sync check relay, and you'll you'll allow yourself a 30 degree uh, window to close on. Okay, interesting topic, and a fairly complicated one, much more so than meets the eye. Now then, what do you do when one side is dead and the other one is live? Well, the conditions are. You always assign the two sides as one is, is called the line side and one's called the bus side. And it can be rather arbitrary which you pick. Sometimes, as in this example, it's rather obvious that this would be the bus side and that this would be the line side. But if, I were, if it was the center breaker, you just have to pick one and make it that and, and connect it up on your, your AC schematics. Okay. Similarly, you can have uh, a dead bus live line or live line dead bus. Now, for in those situations, do you want to have that contact close? Well, it depends. It's a programmable feature in most relays, and generally, yes, you want to have it close. So, here's the question for you. Say, and focus on this contact right here, and so say this, is, say this is a transmission line, okay, and say it's dead, and whatever it's going to is dead, and we want to energize it by closing that circuit breaker. Okay, so we've got live bus, dead line, we allow this contact to close, and then as soon as this breaker closes, we now have the situation where we have live line, live bus, and a zero degree phase angle. What happens if the transition between the two causes this contact to momentarily open? Think about that for a moment. And say, for instance, I'll give you a hint. Say, for instance, this is a control uh, uh, switch, and I'm the guy that's controlling it, and I hold it closed for a second. Now, the, the point I'm looking at is, is if, if this thing doesn't stay closed, it's going to defeat your anti-pumping scheme. It's going to allow the anti-pumping scheme to, re or to reset as soon as it opens. Well, it's going to close right back in because it, it, it's always going to close if you're within that, uh, that window. And now you're going to cycle your breaker. It, it, and that, that presumes, of course, that, that I closed into a fault. Okay? Now then, you're probably thinking to yourself, but Eric, that is so unlikely. How could so many things all go wrong at the same time? Well, funny you would ask, because I've seen it happen. Um, they're a, a very popular breaker ma or a relay manufacturer actually in, had that logic in a product that they put out on the market, and the first people to find it were Port, was Portland General Electric, and they cycled two of their breakers. This is about oh, 16, 18 years ago. So anyway, it's just one of those little things that you want to pay attention to when you're, when you're working with these devices. And the, the 25 function, it, you know, if you're using a relay, particularly one you're not familiar with, it really is worthwhile to dig into it and really understand how that thing works because realize it's got this one little twist in it that if it isn't programmed properly and doesn't operate properly, you're going to, it will defeat your anti-pumping scheme. And we've spent an awful long time talking about how important that scheme is to you. Does that make sense? Okay. Outstanding. So anyway, as I was just describing, um, the transitions between states can defeat your anti-pumping scheme. Now here's a question for you. When is 25 equal to 27? An undervoltage relay. It's a relay that will pick up when your voltage source drops below a certain point. Here's the, the, the little secret about sync check relays. They're actually undervoltage relays. And here's what I mean by that. If you think about this window right here, this, is, this diagram is actually more than just phase angle. The length here is voltage. 
And so if, as I've drawn this arrow right here, it's within a window, a voltage window like that. And in effect, what you're doing is you're taking these two voltage sources, subtracting one from the other, or you're canceling them out. And if that voltage is below a certain amount, you're allowed to close. Almost all, that you can buy standalone uh, sync check relays. They are almost always this, this way. Now, in microprocessor-based relays, that may not be the case. But little, little, the little standalone ones, the, like say you're putting a generator in, um, you know, small generator, or say you're putting in one in your house and you want to be fancy about it and be able to, to parallel up with your utility against all the rules they tell you, that's the device you would use. And again, it actually is just an undervoltage relay. So when I, when I talk about this, I'm being a little tongue-in-cheek, but that's, that's the idea behind it, that your sync check relay is actually a voltage relay. All right, let's talk about some trip logic for a moment. Trip logic is uh, much simpler than closed logic because in the case of trips, when it's time to trip, baby, it is time to trip, and we do not want anything standing in the way of that. And so we usually will have the trip coil leg pretty barren. You're going to have in it a, a breaker status contact so that if the breaker is not closed, you aren't going to be able to energize the trip coil. I mean, why would you want to do that? Because all you're going to do if you do that is, is uh, damage the thing. But other than that, there isn't much in this circuit. So what I want you to do is... Just take, this won't take long because again, there isn't much there. Let's look at, at this circuit right in here. Notice you have 52A contacts. Uh, you've got a resistor there, and I don't actually recall why that is there. But other than that, you have pretty much nothing. Now notice that the amp capacity or the number of amps that it's showing there is pretty high 14.4 amps now why would you want to have a, a trip coil uh, with with that high of an amp you know ampacity going through it it's simply so it'll operate fast you want this thing to really go quickly you want from the time you close a, a, a trip contact you want it within just a millisecond or two or three to, be, to, to have done its thing and starting to pull the, the contacts apart. Does that make sense? I think that's actually pretty intuitive, isn't it? Okay, if you look right above this, you're going to see a contact right here, and it's a 63 contact. And the way this breaker is set up is to uh, trip on low gas. If this were set up to block operate or block trip, you would actually put a B contact right here, and this would not be there. Okay, does that make sense? Again, per pretty intuitive. Okay, if you look over here now at the what I've put on the whiteboard, you'll see how we would wire this up. All of this stuff up above in blue is in the control building then these, these are wires that will then go out to the circuit breaker, this one controlling uh, uh, close, this controlling trip, and we need to have the same DC uh, bus, you know, the same control voltage operating this in the control building. So you're going to run a wire uh, from the breaker back to the control building. Now then, that voltage originated in the control building to begin with, right? So some utilities won't bother to, to do this, which in effect you're bringing it out to the breaker and then taking it back in. This is Southern California Edison's philosophy that you want to bring it out to the breaker so that when you open these test switches that are over here on the uh, far left-hand side, that has killed that whole DC circuit and there's no way that something occurring in the control building can then make it hot 
you know, something hot in the breaker cabinet while you're in there working on it. Um, okay, while 125 volt DC is not uh, uh, medium voltage or high voltage, it is plenty enough voltage to, to hurt you or even potentially kill you. So this is really, from their perspective, this is a, a safety issue. Now, other utilities may not agree, and again, this is the reason that you need to understand what your, you know, the, the, your client's standards and follow them diligently. But anyway, this illustrates uh, their, uh, their philosophy on this. Okay, anyone have any idea why I drew a red light in parallel with the 86 contact? Indication, what am I indicating? You're, you, when the red light is on, the breaker is closed, but it's actually telling you one more thing. And what it's telling you is, is that you have continuity all the way through your, uh, through your trip coil, okay? And if you didn't have continuity, say there was an open circuit down here, the red light would not be on, and even though the breaker's closed, you would know that you cannot rely on that circuit to trip the breaker. So it, it, it's the breaker status, but it adds just a little bit more information to it. Now, um, most utilities, when you go, go to, to a control switch, you'll have a red light and a green light above it. The green light actually is the status, because it's just wired to a, a breaker status contact, then it tells you that the breaker is open. So it's, it's going to be wired to a 52A. But the other one, again, you're picking up an additional piece of information. Now then, look over at this little spot dashed line here. Lo and behold, Southern California Edison does not use this. They have, they just run this uh, uh, to a couple, and they have a particular way they like to do it, and it, you can see it right there on the drawing. But theirs, it truly is just breaker status. Now, the way they get around this is actually rather ingenious. And they use, I, I'm not going to spend too much time in this, on this drawing, but what they do is instead of putting a red light here, they put an input to one of their uh, microprocessor-based relays there, and it achieves the same thing, but it also gets it into SCADA, okay? And so you're monitoring your trip coil and telling SCADA about it. The, the problem with red lights is they're, they're not very communicative. They don't have an output contact that you can do anything with. If you're standing there and looking at it, yeah, fine, but, uh, you know, most, uh, most substations aren't, uh, aren't manned, so you know, you've got that problem. Does that make sense? Again, it, it, it's all about knowing and being certain that the circuit breaker is going to operate and do what it's intended to do. Okay, I want to uh, take a moment away from everything else we're talking about and, and talk about a, an interesting relay that's going to come up here in uh, the near future. And this is a latching switch relay or a latching relay and in the software world, this is actually known as a flip-flop. Okay, the, the top portion that you're looking at right over here, this portion up here, is a version of, of a latching relay that I've made with just a simple auxiliary relay. So I've got an auxiliary relay with a coil that I've labeled Y, and then I've got some other thing that's going to control this. I close X, energize Y, this contact closes, and then I've sealed that in. And then to reset it, I would push the push button Z. Does that make sense? It's pretty straightforward. It's just a seal in. I've just, it's basically a seal in re, uh, uh, circuit. The downside with this is Y is now continually energized. Okay, and that's um, not always what you really want. It would be okay if you're doing this in software. It wouldn't matter because in software, again, as we pointed out earlier, uh, there you're not really drawing real current. It's just uh, it, you know setting a, a bit. 
Well, the way it's um, typically done, you actually have in most uh, uh, latching relays an operate and a reset uh, uh, coil, and then you typically form C contacts on the, out, um, on the outside. So when you hit the operate, these will change state. When you hit reset, they will return to their original state. A question for you. What is the de-energized state of a latching relay? Well, there really isn't one. And so back in the day when I was doing, uh, you know, actually still doing design work, I miss those days, um, what I would do, always do is put a little note underneath the, uh, the contact um, diagram that said that these are shown um, in the state they'd be in after the uh, reset uh, coil was energized. In other words, I'm showing them in the reset state. But again, there, there really isn't a defined state for de-energized for a latching switch. Really. Now, there's a really popular version of latching switch relay made by ElectroSwitch that has all of this functionality, but it also has a handle on it. So if you're an operator in a control building and you want to, say, take a, a, a relay scheme out of service for maintenance, you're able to do so. And now, reali realizing, of course, that it may be connected to SCADA and someone else somewhere could turn it back on. But again, it's a, a really handy functionality to have a, 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 a control handle that someone can operate uh, locally uh, for these. Anyway, uh, in this class, we've uh, spent a fair amount of time, again, going through uh, DC, the DC schematic of a typical circuit breaker. We, we started with where we had been last week and then added a layer of detail on that. And we also spent some time uh, talking about uh, some features of our trip and close circuits that actually aren't in the circuit breaker, but they're back in the control building. Um, we also introduced a couple other features, including trip coil monitoring, uh, uh, the circuits, or excuse me, uh, charging circuits, heaters, and then we talked about the latching relay. And uh, next week, we are going to kind of wrap up our study of uh, circuit breakers we're going to talk about breaker failure schemes. Um, breakers are incredibly important within the power grid, but occasionally, despite our best efforts, they don't work. And it is not okay to have a, a breaker not open if something didn't work and not clear a fault. And that's what breaker failure schemes are all about, and we will get into that next week. All right, thank you.